Father in heaven, we just thank you so much for this this time that we could come and study your word together. And uh, we just thank you that that you are uh, in the midst of us. And we're just seeking your wisdom and your understanding as we study the word tonight. And we also just want to put uh, put uh, Pauline on your on your throne of grace right now in her family. Mm-hmm. But they kind of deal with this situation, but we know that she is she's secure in the knowledge that you are you are there with her. So we just mm-hmm. ask you to bless her. Bless our study tonight, and um, it may be all about you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so verses 20, 24 through 48. I'll read the first four, and then we'll just keep going on until we until we get to the end. Okay. So verse 24, in the morrow after they entered into Caesarea, and Cornelius waited for them and had called together his kinsmen and near friends. And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter took him up, saying, Stand up, I myself also am a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many that were come together. 28. And he said unto them, Ye know that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. But God has showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Therefore came I unto you without gainsaying, as soon as I was sent for. I asked, therefore, for what intent have you sent for me? And Cornelius said, four days ago I was fasting until this hour, and at the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing, and said, Cornelius, thy prayer is heard, and thy alms are had in remembrance in the sight of God. Verse 32. Send therefore to Joppa and call Simon here, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging in the house of Simon, a tanner by the sea. When he comes, he will speak to you. So I sent to you immediately, and you have done well to come. Now therefore we are all present before God to hear all the things commanded you by God. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. Verse 36. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word I say, Ye know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. 39. And we are witnesses of all these things, which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and the dead. Verse 43. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. While Peter yet spoke these words, the Holy Spirit fell on all of them which heard the word, and they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God, Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Spirit as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord, and then prayed they him to tarry certain days. When I was when I was reading this, it it brought me back, of course, to 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 God's or Jesus's command. Remember in Acts 1 8, where he where he gave the, the admonition that the gospel was going to be preached in, in Jerusalem and Judea. Then it was going to go out to Samaria. And then from Samaria, it was going to go out into the uttermost parts parts of the world. And we saw that 
starting to happen, right? We saw, we saw, and I believe it was Acts 8, Philip, you know, was going out. He met the eunuch on the road. So we saw some of it, some of it gaining traction. But I think, I think there was a, there was kind of a hindrance to this message going out that we're, we're obviously reading here right now, this, this, this hindrance, which I think was serious enough for, for God to put this movement into process to have it going, you know, and I, you know, God has been putting on my on my head this this uh, this revival type thing, and you know, revival always starts with a with a crisis. People think revival starts with prayer, but revival usually will start with a crisis. There's a crisis that happens, and I think there's a crisis here. You know, at this point, there there's this there's this point where the gospel needs to go out to the Gentiles, but there are these hindrances, and the hindrances are God. I mean, the hindrances are are the Jews themselves, right? They've they've had this attitude. I think I think it, I think you can even trace it back to when they uh, when they were in Babylon and came out of the exile of Babylon that they kind of you know they hedged themselves in, um, you know, and and kind of shut the Gentiles out, shut the the light of the word of truth out to everybody out there. So, you know, I think Jesus is intervening here to kind of, uh, to kind of uh, put credence into, into this gospel going out. You know, that it seems like it's a very important, important aspect that needs to go out. You know, I found something very interesting, too. And I, I, I shared this when I when I shared a couple of weeks ago uh, in Luke in Luke 13, you know, when Jesus was w- with these people and they were talking about the, the Tower of Siloam, they were talking about uh, uh, Pilate, I believe, shedding the blood of the uh, Galileans, you know, on the altar. So you see these these crises that were occurring at the time that that Jesus was with them. Um, these crises of government and these crises of natural natural disasters happening. But Jesus, of course, he intervenes in that, right? And does doesn't he say, you know, which one of you are worse sinners than these? Is what he was saying. And then he bade them to repent. He called them to repentance. So. So he was trying to change the mindset of the Jewish people for a while that they they had to stop looking inwardly, stop looking at at, you know, their way of thinking and start looking outwardly the way God wants them to look, to look at others, to look at others uh, with with love and with compassion. And that's what he's trying to teach Peter here. And, you know, as we're going to read on too in these in these chapters that this was, I guess, a struggle with Peter to come out of this this mindset that the Gentiles were unclean, even though he recognizes it, right? At one point, doesn't he not want to sit with them, right? So so there's this issue that seems to be um, coming out as a result of it. I see this as a big mindset change for the Jewish nation. No, you had mentioned that you thought, you know, when the Jews came out of Babylon is when they, you know, established this custom of not intermingling with the Gentiles. But I was wondering, yeah, where did that come from? I mean, it seems like God had always wanted them to be a light on the hill. Um, And I don't know, I guess they were so fearful of being led into paganism again that they just went the other extreme. Mm. Well, they they actually built the the idea is they built a wall around Torah, so uh-huh. they they actually started adding extra mm-hmm. extra laws and rules and traditions in there to mm-hmm. protect Torah from from right. being corrupted. So the idea here is that is that that they they saw their past weakness of being con- corrupted or converted by pagan cultures, whether it was Egypt or, or Babylon, as you already mentioned. And then, so when they came out, <clears throat> they decided that they would build these walls around Torah and the best way to keep themselves uncorrupted from the world was to keep the world out. Mm-hmm. So they, they, they went to an, they went to an extreme. And um, of course, this is part of the language here. Of course, you already talked about Acts, the three parts of the kingdom. He's going to go to the Judea and Jerusalem, right? That's the first step. And then he's going to go to Samaria. That's the second step. And then then the gospel is going to go to the Gentiles. That's the third step. So he's talking kingdom language in Acts. That's what God is. Of course, that's the question that just uh, disciples asked him in Acts 1. This this whole thing is all kingdom language in, in, in 10 and 11 because 
the three parts of the kingdom. Of course, you know, there's three visions and then there's three people. And then these things happen three times. And then, you know, so the threes are, and also the calling. And then you, you'll notice the, the discussion takes place. Someone stands at the gate and there's a discussion before there's an entering in or a coming out, right? This is all kingdom language. But the point here is that the, the, the crux of the matter really comes in in, in Peter's vision. Uh, you've already talked about it. I don't know. I'm going to repeat what you already talked about. But see, what happened is that they, he, the, the sheet comes down. We'll see it again in chapter 11. The sheet comes down. And, and of course, God gives Peter three instructions, of course, because it's a three angels message. And he, so he'd rise, kill, and eat, right? So the point here is that then Peter says, well, no, Lord, I've never eaten anything that's common or unclean. Well, see, what happens is <clears throat> when what happened is in the Bible, there's only two categories of food. There's the clean and there's unclean. So what they did, what the Jews did, of course, this is one of the reasons why the Pharisees uh, thought Jesus was a sinner is because what they did is they created another category of their own. And mm -hmm. then what they said, what they taught was if something clean comes into the presence of something that's unclean, then that that, that becomes common. And if it's common, then it's unacceptable. So they actually added a third category. And so what, what happens is, this is why the angel says, don't call something common that God has made clean. Because the point here is that God made it clean. And, and it's, not, it's not corrupted by coming in contact with something that's unclean. So, I mean, these people sound like good Adventists to me here. They're, you know, they're building these walls. <laughs> To protect themselves from the corruption of the world, but in fact, they're 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 actually creating something that God never said. And mm -hmm. so, when when God when God gives them this this, and he, by the way, He picks Peter on purpose because Peter was really the the apostle to the Jews, right? Now, Paul's the one the apostle to the Gentiles. So He picks Peter on purpose because he because God's a troublemaker. He knows it's going to cause problem. He knows that Peter, not only the circumcision people people that are with Peter are going to experience this and go, <gasps> you know, but then ne the next chapter, Peter's going to go back to the people in Jerusalem, the Jews and the, the Jewish Christians, and he's going to explain what they did. And they're going to go, <gasps> and then, you know, then he's got Paul's, you know, Peter's going to explain it. And it's going to, it's going to greatly start tearing down the walls that have been built. And God is trying to desperately tear down those walls because the gospel needs to go to the whole world, you know, to the three parts of the kingdom. So, yeah. You know, that kind of reminds me of uh, Ellen White saying we'll have much to learn and unlearn. They right. they had to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And what's interesting is that so you see in the story, Peter's more worried about his diet than he is about about lost people around him. That's mm -hmm. why I say it sounds like Adventists, you know, to me, mm -hmm. um, we're, we're more worried about what we eat than, than our neighbors are, are lost. And, and so, you know, we're focusing on what not not what God is focusing on. Mm -hmm. uh, it's also interesting, the times, you know, the, 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 the sixth hour, the ninth hour, you know, these are these were prayer times. And, 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 uh, and Cornelius is really he's locked into this. He's already grabbing the spiritual significance of these times to worship God, which is really, really neat, right? So, so yeah, there's just some kingdom dynamic com comments for you. Well, you can see in verse 28, 28 yeah. right? Yes. When he says, you know how it, it is unlawful, unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come into the come unto one of another nation. Mm. See, this is why they thought, thought Jesus was a sinner. Because yeah. he went to talk to the woman at the well, and he went, and he went, he talked to the to the Syrophoenician woman, and he, you know, he ate with sinners, and and see that would make him common, and common they they class common as as part of being unclean. Yes, I'm sorry, Julie. Jean had had her hand up before. Did you I have did. a thought, Jean? Before, I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, it kind of went a little further now, but um, I kind of identify with Peter on this stuff because. I had I didn't have any problem dealing with people that didn't have any knowledge of God, but I did with those particular denominations. And the Lord kind of walked me through this whole thing a little while ago because I came back into contact with some people in that first denomination, and my inward reaction was to repel away from them. God's put me in that circumstance for a reason. How is he going to use me if I'm having this reaction to them? Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Yes, but 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 being being kind to your neighbor isn't the same as marrying your neighbor. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, I mean, what he was saying about the nations they were going into is that they yes. were not to intermarry with them. They were not to mm -hmm. to to intermarry and to adopt their social customs. But he wasn't. <laughs> yeah, I guess states aren't like me, Pastor. All in or all out. Well, the mm -hmm. problem. See, the problem is, and what's what you're seeing is that is that religious people tend to think that that they're okay and corruption comes from outside of them mm -hmm. when in fact that's the opposite of the truth first mm -hmm. of all i'm not okay and corruption doesn't come outside of me corruption is already in me and what i what i encounter outside of me reveals the corruption that's in me so mm -hmm. staying away from sin and evil doesn't make me righteous i'm sorry you know that that whole mindset is mm -hmm. the trap that god is trying to get people out of you know, this okay. is the this is why they crucified Christ because Jesus and and she he mentions John's baptism here as well. That John and Jesus were telling them, no, the corruption isn't something outside of you; it's something you eat or wear or somebody you rub shoulders with. Corruption is inside you, and the mm -hmm. gospel is to transform you from the inside. And once that once that once that gospel takes place, then you begin to realize why the Bible talks about. Um, there's, you know, Paul mentioned in Titus as well as in the book of Acts, he says, nothing outside of you can corrupt you. Mm. You know, then you begin to realize to those, you know, to those who, who believe there's nothing, there's nothing that's corruptible. You can't be corrupted once Christ is in. You know, the, it's, yeah. So again, it's, it's, it's this religious mindset that we get. But isn't it part of our fallen human nature to want to say the problem is out there? Oh, yeah. It's not it's not in me. It's out there because that way it's something we can distance from. If it's in us, then it's scary because we number one, we can't get away from it. Number two, after we try a while, we come to the conclusion that, that we can't fix it. Yeah, you see it in um in not just Judaism, but in many different religions. Um in the Jews, they have the Talmud, which is what um, Pastor Raymond was referring to like all these rules that are not in the Torah and all the different rabbis have different opinions in the Talmud depending on which rabbi you're following and you know but you could be in the Church of Latter-day Saints or or any other conservative group and have the same type of thing you know it's human nature to think that we're going to do something that takes away our guilt and shame other than really just letting God live through us and mm -hmm. to, to understand our true condition. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, Amen. come up with a list of rules so that we can feel better. Yeah. Or feel, feel safer. You know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. We like to set those, set those boundaries. And then, and then point the finger at, Three is coming back at me, but point the finger at somebody else that you guys are doing all these wrong things, you know, like they did to Jesus. Yeah, but then we wonder why we, we can't convert people. And I mean, we're asking people, other people to give up everything they believe and to throw everything that they've ever known, throw it away and accept what we tell them. But we're not willing to, to even challenge anything that we're holding on to. You know, and so we we do not model what we are inviting other people to do, which is why they're not interested because they see the superficiality of what of what we're saying. We you know we don't live what we believe. You know, we don't throw away everything we believe and then just say, "Well, I'm whatever the Word of God says, that's what I'm going to accept." We don't do that. You know, we you know, so we're inviting other people again to do something that we're not doing, which is why they're not interested in following us. But so Jesus was totally different. When Jesus invited people to follow, he was inviting them to do what they saw him do. Mm -hmm. And he right. was willing to do it. He was willing to lay down his life for the people that were his enemies. He was willing to throw everything away and, and, and start from, from whatever the word of God said. I mean, and of course, the word of God is very important here with what's going on in this story, right? Because it's the word of God that um, Peter's going to preach. It's the word of God that Cornelius is interested in hearing. So. Yeah. Yeah, he is the he is the example. Yeah, amen. Yeah, Jean. It, it's also also you're not going to convert anybody if they feel that you're condemning them. And if you get around people 
from the world or from other denominations that think totally different than we do and we're acting like that toward them, are they really going to listen to anything we have to say? The Lord yeah. pointed that out with me with a couple people mm -hmm. that I'm working with down here that um yeah, yeah, that's, don't seem yeah, that's to have true. That's, that's the point. Yeah, that's the point is is that you know as we as we reach out, yeah, we need to be careful. You know, I was <laughs> wanted to focus on, on Cornelius here and um just he's a you know, and I think Pastor pointed out about his devotion to to prayer, to prayer as as a Gentile being there at the ninth hour of prayer. And even in a commentary I was looking at, that's like the that's like the heightened part of the business day as well too. For so for this man who's a leader to be able to take the time to do that, you know, I found something else interesting too, and I think I pointed this out earlier. Um, that it seems like it seems like the, the, in the Gentiles, it's always these leaders and these men of great wealth and position that seem to get called. You know, we see the Ethiopian, we see this one that was a previously in Jesus. Jesus had reached out to a centurion. You know, after the centurion had come to had come to him to to have uh, the servant healed, and uh, so yeah, it's quite interesting. And yet, amongst the Jews, he it seemed like he was always going after the the supposed unlearned unlearned men. So I thought that was a that was an interesting contrast. Um, yeah, with with Cornelius. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, you've probably talked about this before, and I've kind of missed it, but. You know, you read through Acts, and it's so amazing the when the Holy Spirit comes upon them, <laughs> and and it's so obvious and evident. Oh, I, I, I guess I, I don't understand. I mean, we don't. It doesn't seem to happen that way these days. Mm. So what's yeah. what, what's the difference? I was just thinking this is still the fullness fullness of that outpouring of the of that early rain of that early rain experience, and I I just noted that this this one that we experienced seems to be a little bit in reverse. The others were baptized and then they were baptized with the Holy Spirit, baptized with water, and then but here they're baptized with the Holy Spirit and then they're baptized with water. Hmm. Yeah, interestingly, After, After, I mean, the, it's, it, it says the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word so mm. so what kind of falling upon did they experience that everyone around them saw it yeah it. my question yeah well what what they saw the, what the, when the, when the holy spirit comes he empowers the word of god to transform people's lives mm. and so what they saw they saw the word preached transform people right in front of them what what happens is that we we tend to want the Holy Spirit to show events or or you know heal someone or something amazing outside of us. But the the Holy Spirit is come com, whenever the Holy Spirit comes, he 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 enlightens our mind to the Word of God, and then he he takes the power of the Word of God to transform to fix the people inside of the very things that the Word of God is pointing out that need to be fixed. And so most most of us think of the Holy Spirit well. You see the revivals going on in the world now. People think the Holy Spirit is this feeling they get, which has nothing to do with it. Um, or we think when the Holy Spirit comes, or we're going to raise the dead, and we're going to, you know, we're going to do all these miraculous things outside of us. But the fact of the matter is, is that what you see here, what you see here, continuously, the same thing at Pentecost. Holy Spirit empowers not only the Word to take on flesh in people, but then it empowers them to bear witness to the to the Word of God, the power of the Word of God to transform people's lives, and that's what invites. That's what is so inviting for other people. They want the same experience. They want the truth that transforms them. They don't want just information that informs them. And they, and they don't want, you know, people that want truth don't want superficial, you know, magical things going on around them. And there, therein lies the difference. Mm. Are we to assume then that the people around Cornelius and in this group um, didn't all speak the same language? Right. Well, he's a centurion, right? Which okay. means he's in charge of a hundred soldiers, but he's he's a leader, and he has he has all these people in his in his house. Okay. So he sends two servants and a soldier to go to get Peter, right? So yeah, there's lots of different people with 
with different languages. And that's the point here is that God is trying to get the start to get the gospel to go to the Gentiles. Okay. So there's many different people from different nations here. So this this language then would be the same language that, or the same manifestation as the, the different languages that were in Acts 2. You know, yeah, so that that's right. Those, yeah, give them to give them right, right understanding. Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. Amen. Yeah. I think I think when we correctly understand. We, we begin when we begin to realize what the Holy Spirit is doing, which the Holy Spirit always exalt Christ and, Christ and Jesus is the word of God. That when our many times what we what we're asked for, we're expecting something different than what God is trying to do. And what happens here and even with Peter here, Peter's not expecting what's going on. Peter's really not in tune with what's happening. But God is doing something that needs to be done with with his people just haven't still haven't figured out. By the way, I think that's part of what's going to happen when the latter rain has come is that a lot of our stubbornness and a lot of our misgivings and our misunderstandings about things are going to are going to get blown out of the water and and the truth of god is going to go forward because god is trying to save people um mm. yeah and somehow peter peter you know from from his vision on that rooftop he figured it out between there and when he met when he met this centurion you know he figured out you know that 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 the uh yeah that that he shouldn't you know shouldn't be according to the law of the Jews and separate himself from these. So he's right. He's, so he, yeah. You see, he's cautious and he's doubting yeah. himself and he knows what he's always been told, but now he has yeah. a warning. It's like, okay, this is what I've always been told, but you know what? That's not true. Yeah. That can't be true because what yeah. God is telling me is opposite of what I've always been told. Right. And so you see the struggle going on in Peter. And then when he sees the response, this is where the Holy Spirit, of course, God's cool. He's never functions in a box. Like you said, they're not baptized first. Then you see the Holy Spirit. No, they see the Holy Spirit. Then they're baptized. Well, well, God, you did it the wrong way. Excuse me. I'm God. There's no such thing. Right. And so, again, Peter, every, all these comfortable, all, the, all these comfort zone things about, well, I, you know, God has to do it this way. And God says, no, I'm God. I don't have to do it your way. And, and we begin to, you know, that's where these walls that Peter, that he's knocking down at Peter. And, and that's going to be important because when Peter goes back to Jerusalem and shares this with the other Jews and the people that are, that think about circumcision, and all the stuff that Paul's going to run into, they're going to, you know, they, they're about ready to stone Peter because he's, you know, he's doing it wrong. And Peter tells them the story and they go, well, well, I guess, well, if God says so, you know, it's like, yeah. And that's, that's the same, the same awakening that I think we need is that we need to be listening to, to the voice of God, listening to the spirit of God, being led by the spirit of God, because God doesn't, God doesn't fit in any box and every situation, like you're re already reading through Acts, you already know that every situation is different. You know, what happens to Philip isn't the same what happens to Peter. And what happens to Paul isn't the same that happens to, to Barnabas. I mean, it, you know, God is not, God is not restricted. And then that, that's cool, right? Mm -hmm. I would have thought Paul, I, I would have thought Paul would have had this issue more than Peter. I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I'm just thinking of the type of person it sounded like paul was before he was converted you know but yeah but yeah. paul but, but paul wouldn't have had paul wouldn't have had the credibility with the the, the jewish christians mm -hmm. to change the thinking because mm -hmm. paul was already seen as an outsider someone who persecuted you know god sent him as a, to the gospel of gentiles but paul wasn't seen as as a major player in 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 the jewish christians because he was a persecutor mm -hmm. So yeah, he's one of these guys that God did some amazing thing to stop him to killing killing Christians, but he was th there's not credibility there. So it, you know, it's Peter and James that are specifically going to be the leaders of the Jewish Christians that are going to speak up when God moves, and then the rest of the the Jewish Christians are going to listen to what they say because they know that there are leaders already. Hmm. So that's what I I'm it's, it's clear to me why God chooses Peter. Makes sense. Yeah, makes sense. The yeah, same reason why he know goes that he's, the centurion, know, right? He chooses a leader. Go ahead, Julie. I'm sorry. No, never mind. I was just going to interject a joke <laughs> about Peter being the rock that that we know that the church is built on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
you know? Well, I, you know, I recognize the, the cadence of the three things constantly throughout this story. I hope you, you see it as well. It's just, it's just, it's interesting how, you know, God is, <laughs> God is so cool in terms of the kingdom dynamics and the way that he does what he's doing. That uh, it, it's, God is just really neat. Amen. Didn't give P Peter much chance to misunderstand either because the sheet came down three times right before the three men show up at the door. Yep. You know? Yep. Amen. And then to and then to validate it, the Holy Spirit falls on them. You know, it's just, I mean, how can you argue with that? I mean, if you were to have a child read this passage and ask the a child that can barely read what it means, the child would know that he's referring to people, not whether you can eat unclean animals. But it's interesting how that gets twisted. Totally out of context. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, well, the denominations that I was in before believed that this pertained to that you could eat anything now. So That's people what I'm saying. believe what they... People believe what they want to believe. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Like even a child could interpret that correctly. But if, if somebody wants to psychologically use, you know, that's what they do. They just use scripture for what they already want to believe, not what it really says. They also use it out of context that, you know, has been pointed out to me multiple times that if you read what's in front of it and behind it, then you can see what's going on. But. Yeah. If you just get stuck on that one thing, then you can. It's like the parable of Lazarus and the rich man. It's kind of the same, same yeah. kind of, same kind of vein. Yeah. You know, this, this Cornelius, you know, I was just thinking about another aspect of, of him too. You know, when he saw Peter, of course, he bows down to, to worship him. And, and obviously we don't, we don't worship other men, but you know, he, he, he was such a reverent, you know, to me, I saw it as he, he was being such a reverent, reverent man and, and wise know God and I, I see it in him as just you know this this man came like the vision came to fruition here you know I'm, I'm bowing down to him and of course you know Peter Peter straightened him out on it but again I think it's just it just speaks to the the reverence that that Cornelius is kind of holding you know um regarding God and is is wanting to seek more understanding um well, that's you know, cool there too because Cornelius understands kingdom, the kingdom dynamics. He meets him, he falls down before him, then he worships him. That's the three-step process. Cornelius <laughs> understands kingdom dynamics, of course he does, because he's a, he's a centurion, so he he's a servant of the king, so he understands. I mean, when he sends the messengers to 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 Peter, he sends two servants with a soldier. He he understands the whole. He see that that's what's amazing about the Bible is that these people understood so much of what we don't understand, and we think we still think we're smarter than them, mm -hmm. and, and we don't understand what we're reading, but they under, they would understand this very clearly. Pastor, yeah. would you explain that? Because I don't understand that. Why two servants and a soldier? I mean, I get the three. Yes, but there's always two witnesses, right? And it, it, by the way, he calls them, oh. right? two witnesses and then there's a soldier the soldier a soldier is always the executor or the kingly function that goes to with, with authority to support the two witnesses hmm. nice okay. the Amen. two witnesses are bearing witness of of cornelius cornelius is a soldier so he sends a soldier and when, when you see him talk when, he, when you see him standing at the door having these conversations you you see the same process of the idea of someone coming to the to the gate of a castle and having this discussion about what's going in and what's going out, and then they when the discussion happens, then they're invited in, or when or then they're then Peter's called out, right? That that's all the same. It's all the same language. It's gospel language. Mm -hmm. They're being called out of one mindset, one kingdom, one paradigm structure, one way of thinking. They're being called out of that into another paradigm, another kingdom, another way of thinking, mm -hmm. and that's the whole idea of rise kill and eat peter right that's what the rise is is a change of your thinking you know and then kill is the function of your will and then eat that's a behavior so god deals with mind then the will then it then it, go, it governs your your behavior so that's the 
That's the transformation of the gospel. That's when the word of God takes on flesh. It changes the way I think. It, cha- it, it empowers my will to function in harmony with the word of God. And then, then my, the behavior is manifested in, in the change of my mind and my will. Which is exactly what Peter went through when he yes. had the transition. He That's had right. to rise. He had kill. to kill and he had to eat. Spiritually. Some new yeah. information. Kill, kill the old information, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Babylon right. has to fall, doesn't it? Babylon has to fall, right. Mm-hmm. That's right. There's the three angels' messages right there. That's so cool. Uh, yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> that's a surprise, huh? <laughs> <laughs> we knew it was there. We just had to figure out where. Well, that's so, what's so neat. Is it's yeah. all over. I mean, this whole, yeah. if you look at the how many times in the story the word called is used, right? Mm-hmm. They're called. They're called. They're chosen. Then they they become. Then they're faithful. Well, the, the, this is this is yeah. I'm 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 sorry. I'm in the same <laughs> string on the same guitar. It's just the God, the, the eternal gospel. It's there too, and that's yeah. praise God. Praise God that it's there. So was this? Do you think this man who stood in 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 uh, stood before Cornelius in his vision and bright clothing? Do you think that was Jesus himself? Yes, I'm, you guys are all quiet. You're asking me. <laughs> I'm just. I, I, don't I just think, I don't think we know for sure. No, it, I mean, we, it just says it just says an angel. Um, well, the King James. It, 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 yeah. it could be. Doesn't. I mean, see the, the, again. The difference. It doesn't matter if God's. If the if the King sends a messenger, that messenger, that ambassador represents the King. It's right. the same as the King himself. So whether it's Jesus or whether it's an angel that's going with a message from Jesus, see, in the king, in a, in a, in a person that goes up in the kingdom, it's the same thing. The, you treat that messenger as if he's the king, because he mm-hmm. literally is, right? So, so I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's an interesting question. I don't think you're going to find an answer for, in the Bible from it. But the point is, is that he, he sees this angel standing in bright clothes. He knows who it is, or he knows who he represents. Yes, and that makes sense now with Cornelius bowing down to Peter because he yes. sees him as a messenger from because God. That's right, that, because Peter that totally is makes ambassador. sense. Yeah, and so oh. Peter Peter Amen. gets him to stand up, but the, but you know Cornelius is not a dummy. Yeah, yeah, that is so cool. You know, that's it makes, like, you, makes you think about the fact, though, that God has the Elijah messengers. We're not God, but there's there's a message that God has his people and it shows we need to respect someone that has a message from God. That's right. And the way you treat the messenger is the way you're going to treat the one who sends it. Of course, mm-hmm. that's why Jesus knows the way they treated John. He knows what's going to happen to him. Mm-hmm. Right. right. So, Which is why God, Jesus has said, if they treated me this way, don't be surprised when you're treated the same. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Gene, you had your hand up? Yeah, it's just like me trying to figure out if something's imparted to me. Was that, you know, I got stuck on this question the other day. Was that the Holy Spirit or are my angels speaking to me? Well, the answer is, what's the difference? Right, <laughs> right, yeah. right. Mm-hmm. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Sometimes it's best not to know. But that makes, yeah, that makes perfect sense sense now yeah because what moses was a messenger from god and and he he said you you'll treat him like a god right moses will be looked upon like 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 god yeah amen because he's his messenger that makes that makes perfect sense well when i think about the youth that made fun of elijah and they said go up bald head things didn't go too well for them after they did that yeah well if you notice in the in the narrative here um when Peter opens his mouth and then he starts talking, how many times he mentions witnesses and testifying, right? You'll, you'll notice if you start seeing how many times he says it, then you, you realize that, uh, you know, that's the whole, the whole idea of a witness or a, an ambassador of a kingdom going forth to testify mm-hmm. or to, to proclaim the, the news of the, of the new kingdom. That's, you know, that's the language that he keeps using over and over and over again. Mm. Amen. 
So you have called and then chosen. And of course, Peter's trying to be faithful. And then Cornelius is already being faithful. So, you know, you have the three called, chosen, and faithful. Yeah, I have witnesses three times in Peter's speech, at least in the King James. I think that's all I see is three. Well, in 42, he also says, and testify. He commands us to preach, to testify, right? So testifying and being a witness, same idea. But yes, the repetition of the three is, is is similar. Hey, so since you brought it up, Pastor, the opening the opening of the mouth, it, it took me back to Ezekiel 29, 21. Now, I know Ezekiel 29, 21, when we studied that out before, I know we, we pointed that we pointed that forward because it's it's the horn. But but in a sense, is isn't this that you, you see this you see this conflict of things that are going to be changing? There's this. You know, the Jewish nation is is the king of the south, isn't it, at this time? It's Egypt and Sodom, where our Lord was crucified. You know, in that sense, and isn't Rome coming to conquer them, the king of the north? So are we getting are we getting a little bit of that, that typology here, or am I thinking way too out there? No, I, I, th- I think it's similar. Uh, you see a lot of standing up here. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, he talks about uh, in verse 42... Right, he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and the dead. So mm-hmm. you're dealing with the judgment of the living and the judgment of the dead, right? So so this this judgment process is going forward, and then he says um, to give to give to him give all the prophets witness that through his name whosoever believes in him shall receive remission of sins. Remissions of sins is the day of atonement. That's when your sins are remitted. That's when your sins are removed, mm. right? So, see, in Peter's mind, and in and in the Jews, Jewish Christians' mind, they don't they don't think they they don't actually see thousands of years before Jesus is coming back. They think the last days have taken place. That mm. Christ has died. He he was resurrected. He was with with them for forty days. He ascended to heaven, and they they think that very soon. You know, when the destruction of Jerusalem and all this stuff t- takes place, they believe that's going to be the end of the world. They don't they don't have it in their mind that the gospel needs to go to all these Gentiles. As you can see, they don't that's not part of their thinking. So yeah. they you know, Peter talks about in his letters, he talks about that they're in the last days and they are in the last days. So mm-hmm. this becomes a type. This is a judgment of the living and the end of the probationary period for the Jewish nation, Jewish people. That's a, actually a type of the end that you're talking about in terms of of what you're talking about for us. So it is. It's a pattern that repeats itself. So mm-hmm. there's what you're seeing is, is correct. It's fine. It's just it's the, the pattern. Opening, gets, yeah. it, the pattern gets bigger and bigger as it goes to the end. At the end, yeah. it's a worldwide pattern. Yeah. Because that opening of the mouth, you know, it it, it it just signifies that, you know, God has done something in place where now he can open the mouth and speak because of what God has done. That's right. Yeah. And the opening of the mouth is connected to the opening of heaven in verse 11 of the same cha- same chapter, right? Uh, when he has the vision, says, I saw heaven opened. Mm, right. So that's the same idea. Amen. It's a revelation of God. Now, the other thing we haven't talked about is, well, we mentioned it, but the, 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 the word, the word. And then when Peter spoke, spoke these words, the Holy Spirit fell, right? So the word of God is, is, the, is the foundation of the revival. By the way, that's so important. I don't know if you've seen these pictures of this Asbury revival and all this other stuff. You got all these people standing there waving their arms around. No one's holding a Bible. The, the, the basis of the revival that you see going on in our culture is not the word of God. And they're trying to compare it already to the first and second great awakening in the, the one that happened in the late 16, early 1700s. And then the one that happened in the early 1800s, they're trying to compare the two. They're not compared. The, the first and second great awakening were based on the word of God. You get pictures of those. Those people are holding their Bible. They're studying their scriptures. What's going on now? People stand there waving their hands in the air and having these feelings. That's not a that's not awakening. That's not a revival. Revival is always based on the Word of God, and so you know that's what you see taking place here in in, in Acts ten. The Word of God, the Word of God, is is front and center, and that's Jesus. In essence, that's Jesus, and Jesus that's needs right. to in the, midst, in the midst of that revival. It has to be. It has to be Jesus. That's right. Yeah. 
Yeah, there's been a lot of, a lot of time. And, and, you know, there's a lot of these revivals in the past that, you know, that have, that have come about, you know, that I, I was listening to one of the Asbury ones too, and they talked about the history of, of these revivals and, and they didn't come, they didn't come to fruition for whatever reason they didn't come to it. But I think the common denominator is when you take your eyes off Jesus and, and get away from the word, that's when things will really start to go south. Yeah. You know? A lot of people are very easily deceived that number one, they haven't been taught not to go by their feelings. Um, they haven't been taught to go on principle. They don't even know anything about principle. There were true healings and true prophecy and stuff happening back then, but these aren't. And people are very easily deceived by those things and they're going by their feelings. But the Pentecostal movement, I think, is still moving, you know, even even through to this day. I, I think it, it is because it's it, when it's centered in Christ, there there is the there is the revival. And I think there is the the essence essence of it, and that's what keeps it strengthened through the through the through time. You know, even though there's a lot of lot of waning, you know, even in these supposed revivals and stuff. And I think there's probably individuals here that that did have a you know, uh, a revelation of of the need of Jesus in their lives, and and you just hope that that you know that that seed that the Spirit is planting in them will will continue to root and grow, and that. Uh, you know, that they'll come to God, come to God for their understanding, for sure. Even though there's definitely some error in some of these groups, what I do appreciate is that many do believe in the power of God, yeah. whereas many in our own denomination don't actually believe that God still works miracles, mm -hmm. even though they're happening all the time. And, yeah. you know, if... If somebody was to be a prophet today or have a dream or a vision, it would yeah. typically get shot down as false, even just assuming that it's false. And I think that's wrong. I don't think we ought to be so quick to judge. I think we ought to test the spirits um, and be open. But, you know, I asked a question to one person. I said, well, the 144,000, I said, you don't think that those could possibly be prophets of the lord oh no well, it's only only one prophet you know back in the 1800s that mm -hmm. seems to be the mentality that many people have that you know we we don't we don't want to um despise prophesying we don't but we don't want to be you know gullible and and be deceived so but i think we need to be open well for every true thing of god satan has a false one that, right. you know and i've run into it you know the false holy spirit the false healings the false prophecy and people have gotten so freaked out by some of those false things that then they're afraid of the real holy spirit or they don't believe that there's real healings or real prophecy that's right prophecy is describing someone's essence and so when i come to see when i can discern somebody's essence that's prophesying. That's what a prophet does. Mm -hmm. So, again, there needs to be an education about uh, the spirit of prophecy. You know, the spirit of prophecy. Mrs. White wrote, wrote, wrote volumes to other people about what was going on in the secret parts of their life. That's what a prophet does. A prophet doesn't tell the future or what's going to happen at the end. That was not her role. And if you look at look at the, the volume of, of her writings and you look at the percentage of what she wrote about, 90 some percent of what she wrote was to individual people about their personal issues because she's describing someone's essence, their character. And she's warning them, showing them themselves, warning them. It, so again, the spirit of prophecy needs to come up back to God's people. And the spirit of prophecy is to discern the essence, the name, the character of the individuals, and then to reach out to them and love and, and warn them, look, this is a troubled area in your life. If you don't, if you don't pay attention here, Satan's going to take you down. You know, that's what a prophet is doing. So part of the reason why the spirit of prophecy is, is, is null and void and it's on dusty books on somebody's shelf is because we don't understand what the spirit of prophecy really is. But when this Holy Spirit does come and these gifts start coming back to the church in full, then there will be understanding. As I said, the Holy Spirit takes the word of God and makes it, helps us to understand. Mm -hmm. 
And by the way, I think the false is happening, which means the true is coming. Yes. Amen. And I think this false thing is going to keep on going more and more and swing the pendulum that we, we've been saying the pendulum is going to swing back from this immoral country that we live in to be this religious, re, religious zealous country. Um, mm -hmm. The pendulum is going to swing back, but it's not going to be a good thing. Mm -mm. No, not mm -hmm. at all. Some people are so hungry for, for God and for truth that they will believe anything that's put in front of them. And if, if it's anything that's supernatural, some people think that anything that's supernatural is of God. That is not the truth. Well, the main thing is, is that people function by their feelings. And they want an experience that makes them feel better instead of encountering God, which doesn't make me feel better, makes me feel barely bad because I see myself as I am. The joy that I have is because God's dealing with issues that need to be dealt with. So what people crave is actually to fulfill the desires of their, of their flesh, which is to feel better. And they think when they, if they have this experience and something overwhelms them, they have this feeling, then they think that's the spirit of God moving. And that's, you know, that's exactly the opposite of what the Bible teaches. But of course, um, these false spirits that, you know, they don't test the spirit to see if it's from God. The, the false spirits are all about making people, enabling people and their problems, making them feel better while they're still broken or they're still a slave to the sin that they have. And then, um, then of course they think they're fine when they when they're still enslaved, and they so they don't see a, a need to move. But the spirit of God is the opposite. The spirit of God comes, and like Peter, when when he when the spirit of God comes, and, and Peter has a vision, Peter says, "Oh, that was wonderful. I just feel good." No, Peter's going, "What the heck just happened? My world's falling apart. This isn't right. Something's wrong." You know, Peter's troubled, right? Mm -hmm. So you, you know it's from God because Peter's unsettled. He's, you know, he's wrestling with things. The, when the Spirit of God comes, it's supposed to challenge us to grow. Mm -hmm. you know, Jesus said the Spirit, when he comes, he'll convict of sin and of righteousness and then judgment. He doesn't say it's going to make you feel good. So there is, and by the way, there's a big misunderstanding even within Adventism. The reason why there's drums and all this music is, is entering into Adventist worship is because Adventists, especially the Adventist youth are being taught the same thing that, that if I feel good, that's the spirit of God moving. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when, when I was in those first two denominations, it's like you'd go and it was like getting high on the, the music and the stuff that was going on. But the minute you walked out in the real world, closed back in, you were in the same exact shape or worse off than the one you came. I have a question. Yeah. So um, I always look at this as that, you know, this is a big event um, going out to the next group of people, the Jews to the Gentiles. But, but what about the flip side of that? When Cornelius was praying, and he's a devout Jew, he's, he's still thinking, can we assume that he, he's like an old, old time Jew and he's, he's doing the services um, as he would know it as the Jewish nation would. And he really doesn't know anything about Jesus, Jesus specifically. And so that's why God, an angel comes to Cornelius and says, Hey, you know, we've heard you, you know, you need to call this guy, Peter. And, you know, Peter shows up and in uh, wherever we were, in somewhere around 36, he says, the word which God sent unto his children of Israel preached by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. Then 37, then he goes into, well, you know about, you know, what John preached in the baptism, but he really doesn't, you know, talk about that he knew really Jesus. And it seems like John's narration from there goes on to talking about Jesus of Nazareth. So his his focus is being directed. Cornelius's focus is being directed from um, the the traditional Jew thinking to now more of Jesus Christ and, and his mission 
um, and what Christ's mission was. Is that, is, can I think that in my mind? Is that kind of what's taking place here too? Yeah, I think so. I think that's partially correct. I think, I think that uh, Cornelius is a centurion, so he's, he's not unaware of the events that have happened with Jesus, but he hasn't, he, as a, as a Roman, he doesn't see the significance of those events um, while they're happening, just like the Jews didn't see the significance of the events. But, but you know, well, he may be a centurion, but was he, what, what area was he living in? Well, he says that he's in uh, Caesarea. Caesarea. And where is that? I, I, Caesarea. Geographic. Caesarea, for example, is one of the places where, remember in Caesarea, that's where Jesus heals the nobleman's son. Yeah. Okay. But Caesarea, you know, Jesus' ministry has raised a lot of questions. And by the way, all the Romans, especially the centurions, were well aware because what happened in those days, they were always worried about an uprising taking place. So whenever they saw crowds gathering and something gathering energy or excitement in the Jewish people, they were always worried about having another revolt. So they were always very sensitive to these things. Um, so I, I think that I, the way that Peter talks, the way that the Holy Spirit has Peter talking to the centurion, it becomes obvious to me that he's, that he's aware of events that have happened. He just doesn't know their significance. I mean, 39, he talks about we are witness of these things. So, uh, you know, we could be we as in those who came with Peter, or it could be re including. Um, well, well, yes. Cornelius as, as well, um, but he's definitely whom, whom they slew and hung on a tree. He wasn't he wasn't blaming Cornelius as a centurion putting them on he he's he's saying yeah we know we know who put christ on the tree um right but this the inclusiveness in 39 we are witnesses of all all things which he did both in in the land of the jews and in jerusalem whom they slew and hung on the tree right so he's a, so he know i i i'm i perceive that um sent that cornelius is aware of of the of Jesus and some happenings within the Jewish nation, but he he Cornelius isn't seeing the significance of it. Right, right. So that's right. where Peter is 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 actually identifying the significance of what has taken place. And of course, then yeah. he exalts Christ in the gospel. Yeah. Much like um, Paul you know, zealous to do the right work, but misguided in the work he was doing. Because it's very interesting, you know, you think of the story of the centurion, whom Jesus, remember this this Roman centurion, this nobleman comes to Jesus and about, ask about healing his son. Well, he was, he was, he was a, the same as, as Cornelius. He was a, um, a, a man of importance in the Roman army, but he had, he saw something in the Jewish religion that spoke to his heart that, that what he, that was not in the Roman, Roman culture, Roman religion. And so he was attracted to that light. So I think, you know, St. Cornelius kind of falls into that category, but here, you know, God wants to shine more light to Cornelius and of course, all the people that are in his house. And uh, God is using this to break down those walls that we had talked about before. There's a lot of praying going on in this chapter, you know. Amen. Amen. They're praying at the beginning, they're praying in the middle, and they're praying at the end. <laughs> Three days it took, right, for them to get an answer. Yeah. <laughs> you got to cry out. You got to cry out. There's the three again. <laughs> And well, then what's, the fourth what's day, you know, if Craig was here, he'd say, you know. <laughs> He'll be back gonna, next week. He's headed gonna, back to Florida Thursday. <laughs> well, it's interesting. This this story is so important that you're going to hear it repeated, repeated next chapter when Peter's going to be telling it to the Jews. Mm -hmm. So... The importance of this story is, is significant in that it's that it's repeated, repeated, and repeated. 
I think it's repeated three times. I mean, that what happens to Peter happens. And then Peter says it happens. Then in chapter 11, he's going to tell him again it happened. Mm -hmm. So um, the, Holy Spirit's, the Holy Spirit's making a point here. What is this thing with the centurions? There's a centurion at the bottom of the cross when Christ dies. And he says, surely this is the son of God. It was the centurion with the, the child he wanted healed and speak the word only. Now we got another centurion. Boy, centurions seem to figure in this kind of high. To me, I think that you, it's like Pastor would say, the three people groups. At the cross, you had the, the Jew. You had the... Um, I'm an Iranian. That's right. Yeah. And and then you had the three groups, you know, you have you lay you basically had Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Right. Because you had right. Simon who carried the cross. Yeah. And then the thief on the cross. And the thief and on the cross. The centurion. And the centurion was the three. Right. They're all three that bear witness to Christ's death, right? Mm -hmm. Oh. Amen. Yeah. Yeah, centurion is a, a centurion, of course, centur it comes from the word 100, right? So he's he's the ruler or the lord of 100 soldiers. He's actually the commander of 100 soldiers. And by the way, in the Roman army, you don't get that position by being a nice guy. I mean, they were the Roman armies were known for butchering people, right? So so these the 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 conversion of a centurion is as a, as a conversion of a hard a person that was would be seen from a Roman perspective as a hard man, right? Mm. Um, he's very just, loyal. Yeah, he's very loyal too. He's from the Italian band, which means he was a, a loyalty regiment that was loyal to the whoever the leader was in that area. Right. Yeah, unquestionable. Yeah. Yep. Mm. So it's interesting that when God sends the message out to another group, He starts with people that are influential so that the you know they're they're going to influence a lot of other people mm. yeah and if christ can convert centurions then there's hope for me huh mm -hmm. amen amen i like that that the, peter realizes that god is no respecter of persons yes <laughs> And we read it and we think, you know, how, how slow could they be, right? <laughs> and then we, oh boy. About as slow as us. Then we turn around and do the same thing. Right. Well, when you think about the three wise men, they wouldn't have ever been allowed, you know, in any holy place because they were, they were the uncircumcised. And yet the wise men understood and came to worship the savior when the others didn't even know hence hence the, the term wise wise men and weren't the shepherds considered unclean too yeah they're kind of the lowest of the low well that's so, what's cool about reading these stories is because the gospel of the gentiles that's you and me <laughs> so god's reaching the lowest of the low that's you and me we're that's who we are in the story the, the gospel has come. The gospel is available to us. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. And he Even showed that worthy. right in. <laughs> and he showed that right in the beginning with the shepherds and with the wise men, right? Amen. And they came and worshipped. And the lepers and all those other unclean people. Mm -hmm. Amen. Well, thank God Jesus never had any problem with touching unclean people. Well, and I, I, that, I think that's part of what he, God is trying to get through to us, is that you, can, you cannot be contaminated from outside of you. So it doesn't matter who you, who you talk to or, or, you know, all this stuff that, you know, we as Adventist religious people, we obsess over. You know, defilement doesn't come from outside of us, in us. It, defilement is in us. But to those to those who are pure, there's nothing. Nothing's impure. You know that the idea that I I can't not like we said in Romans, there's nothing can separate me from the love of God. So you know 
we have to stop obsessing about all the things outside of us as if it's corrupting and, and go out in the world as a, as a force for good to touch people's lives, no matter who they are, where they are, what they're doing to touch them and share the gospel so they can be saved. And then we, we're not corrupted by that. It's, it's actually matures us in rightness. Can you imagine how they freaked when Jesus touched the leper? But the one that was transformed wasn't him, it was the leper. Yeah, so those beasts on that sheet. <laughs> Who are those beasts? <laughs> yeah. That's a good point. Those lives, their lives are going to be transformed by being touched by the gospel. That's who those beasts are. And those creepy, crawly, nasty beasts, that's that's you and me. Well, me anyway. You can own it or not, but. Amen. That is so cool. Yeah. So a lot of these people that are preaching the stuff, this wrong stuff, they don't even know it's wrong. It's not like they're teaching heresies on purpose. They, they really believe it. God it knows back, their hearts. That goes back to Jesus praying for them, forgive them. They know not what they do. Some of them have their heart in the right place, though. I mean, it's not a matter of just understanding truth. That does that being smarter isn't going to get us into the kingdom. Right. But they'll respond to the light when they see it. That's right. Mm. That's right. Amen. And many of them are. I'm seeing it. But it can't be because we think we know better. We're reaching down. No, no. Yeah. Right. Amen. No, the, usually the Holy Spirit kind of taps them on the shoulder and they start doing like I did, saying, there must be more to this than this. I found the only way to, to work with people is just to love them and spend time with them. That's right. And then they'll, they'll bring their problems and their woes to you and you can just love them and support them and pray with them and the lives are changed, you know, I mean, yeah. but it's, it's not instant. It's, it's years sometimes. Yeah. Right where he's got me at right now. Shut your mouth. Don't preach. Just be there. Be supportive. Pray for them and care. Hmm? Well, and, and I would add, open your eyes, mm -hmm. right? Because when you see, when you begin to understand your, your issues, what you're going through, when you see other people, you, then you can discern very quickly what they're going through. That's right. And it, and it can take years to build a bridge, but it doesn't have to. You know, you can, if you're listening and you're, and you're paying attention, people recognize someone that actually cares about them and hears what they're saying and listens right. to them. Because very few people in this world feel listened to. They don't, they, they think no one listens, no one really cares. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so when you actually listen to what they're saying and you pay attention to what they're saying, and then then the next time you meet them, they, they I mean, they talk about their aunt. Next time you meet them, oh, how's your aunt doing? I'm praying for her. And then they stop. Oh, man, this guy actually heard what I said. I mean, he listened. He must really care. And, and when, you, when you build those bridges, when we build those bridges with people, once they know you care, then they care about what you know. They start okay. asking, well, what is with, what's up with you? It's you know, exactly you're not how like you. all these other people. What's going on with you? And then, then, you know, that's when you can, when they start asking, that's when you can start sharing the gospel. Amen. And they will ask. Yeah. And, and when they're, ready, they're going to the, ask. That's the gift of prophecy right there. That's the gift of prophecy. Understanding people's needs and then seeing their need and praying for them and reaching out to help them with their need. That's what prophets do. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the spirit of prophecy is to come up to life again in the lives of God's people. I went down to help my neighbor out uh, today because his walkway had like a foot and a half of snow on it. And he has food deliveries and they had no way to get the food deliveries in. So I walked down and shoveled it. He came out and he said to me, isn't this too much for you? And I said, yeah, probably, but it's got to be done. Your food delivery's got to get through. He said, oh, thank you very much. 
Then he stuck his head back out. He usually won't let me in the house because I'm not vaccinated. He said, you want to come in and get warm? I said, sure, thanks. So I went in. I had two pairs of gloves on me and they were both soaked. And I said something about the wet gloves. And he said, there's a stack of gloves over there on the, on the couch that they're waterproof. You want to help yourself to a pair? So I went over and helped myself to a pair and thanked him very much. And then I asked him how his daughter was. He's got a daughter that's out in Washington state. And I said, is, I see the stuff that's going on in California. Is she in danger from that? So he talked quite a while about his daughter. Then I left and he, I said, well, I'm going to walk back home now and I'm going to call the plow and tell him to come plow us back out again because the town plowed all the snow right back into our driveways. And uh, I told him, I said, I can't find your mailbox. So I'll have Craig find it for us. <laughs> and uh, he said, oh, thank you very much. Thank you. You're still saying thank you when I left. What, is, what does Mrs. White call that? Disinterested benevolence? Amen. Amen. Dear Lord, we thank you for the blessings of every day. We thank you for our church family that can gather here. We thank you for Cornelius and Peter. And we can uh, think of what a simple fisherman can do and how he can change the world. We pray, Lord, that the Holy Spirit uh, can move on our lives, that we'll be willing to take the time to pray that we will be willing to take the time to listen and we'll be willing to uh, pick up our feet and go in the direction you want us to trod for your mission, wherever it might be. Thank you for these stories. Thank you that we can apply them to our lives, that we can have a closer walk with thee and that uh, we will all be looking forward to heaven um, for what, what, what? What, what was that you said, Julia? As we get older, we all start saying. Thinking of the hereafter. Thinking hereafter. Thank you. Thank you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.